Hey guys, it's Steve from Featherlight, and today we're talking about latency, maybe one of the most aggravating things that plagues everybody who's doing some kind of computer recording. And the reason why is because it's a moving target. Latency is radically different at the beginning of the project when you have very few tracks and effects versus towards the end of the project where you might have a ton of tracks and a lot of different effects and a lot of different VSTIs. All of those affect your latency. The first and easiest method is adjusting the audio buffers inside your actual DAW. And those are going to interact directly with your audio interface and those drivers. They're really responsible for how low latency you can get away with before you start running into trouble. So let's find out where those are. Here inside of Cubase, one of the first places to check your latency related issues is up here in the menu bar. Choose Studio, navigate down to Studio Setup. And we're in the audio system. This is going to be whichever audio interface you're using at the time. This window also shows our current latency settings as well as the round trip ASIO guard settings and our advanced options, which for the time being are best left at default. Our particular audio interface is the Pro FX at the moment. So from here, if we choose whichever one of those you're currently using, in our case, it's the Pro FX, we'll see all of the associated settings so yours will look different or be called something different. If we click on control panel here, this opens up our device settings and allows us to change our audio buffer latency settings. Our particular audio interface is pretty bare bones. It just shows the latency settings and it gives us the option of adjusting them from 32 samples all the way up to 2048. If you're using a Focusrite Scarlett, its configuration panel might look like this. If you're using a Personas product, its universal control panel might look like this. If you're using a MacBook Pro with built-in audio, its core audio panel might look like this. If you're on PC, using a dedicated audio interface will always provide much better results than simply using the onboard sound card of your motherboard. Here's our project at the correct latency. It plays back fine. The time that you pull me in, I wind up on the floor. About but if we go up to studio and we come down to studio setup, go to our control panel and we select a latency buffer size that's considerably smaller, say here at 32. You can see these input and output latencies now are extremely low, which is great for tracking, but we end up with something like this. And this is pretty typical of a really large project with a lot of intense effects and VSTIs with incredibly low latencies. And so setting your latency for your project is a dance between your project density and how much stuff is going on versus the clarity of it. So the best is to pick a part of the song that's really open in the beginning where you can hear it clearly. And this will give you a much better idea with an open section of your song, whether or not you're actually getting latency related dropouts. This next method involves what's known as direct monitoring. And direct monitoring is used by a lot of different hardware audio interfaces. And it's different on all interfaces, or there are some similarities, and there's some downsides to it as well. So let's dive in and find out how we can make that work to our advantage. Some audio interfaces like this Focusrite Scarlett have a direct monitoring switch on the faceplate, and then from there you go into the audio control panel and adjust the direct monitoring controls from there. This audio interface from Steinberg actually has a direct monitoring mix knob right on the face of the unit, allowing you to mix between your input to the audio interface and the returns from the DAW. And here with this Audient ID4 interface, we see the same controls right here on the face of the unit. And even some of the smaller format mixers that may not have all the routing options and connections that its larger siblings offer, still have that same direct monitor blend knob right on the face of the mixer. In this example, we're gonna be using the direct monitoring feature of our audio interface. And that's the blend knob that you see here. All the way to the left, that's 100% what's coming through the audio interface direct to our headphones. And all the way to the right is 100% computer playback. The reason that that's an issue is if we set it all the way to this side, or say the majority of that side, and we actually monitor our track here, this is what happens. Check, check, check. check, check. check. You, you immediately, immediately hear, hear that, that latency. latency. So, so if we want to use all those effects, we're going to incur pretty significant latency to do it. And that's when you hear that echo feature. And you're going to hear that in your headphones as well. And that's extremely distracting to get around. So if we come up here to studio, 
and we go to studio setup and we go to our control panel like we showed you in the previous example and we set that at an incredibly low latency you can see now that our input and output latencies are considerably tighter now when we engage our monitor button check one two 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 you can see and hear that those are much tighter latencies but even at the lowest latency of 32 buffers there's still a significant delay coming back to your headphones and that's extremely distracting so instead we're going to disengage the channel monitoring feature here on our track and we're going to use just the direct monitoring feature on our audio interface instead. It's super responsive and it sounds great. However, it's also completely dry as we're not hearing any of the effects that are on the channel in the DAW. Some interfaces do support onboard DSP that don't get recorded, but ours does not. So that's really gonna be up to your audio interface. This next method involves kind of a trick. It's a combination of direct monitoring, but it also involves using some of the effects inside your DAW. And it's great for things like recording vocals, when you're recording direct with yourself, but maybe your audio interface when you're using direct monitoring doesn't give you any kind of effects. There's no onboard effects in the monitoring section of your audio interface, which means you're gonna be recording dry vocals. That's pretty uninspiring. So here's kind of a clever way around that to use the direct monitoring feature of your audio interface, but also use some of your DAW's effects as well. Let's check it out. All right, so we have a standard folk project here. We want to add a male vocalist part to this project. And we're going to be using the direct monitoring feature of our audio interface that we showed you in the last example. That allows us to bypass the computer's latency altogether and have a nice, tight, and clean performance from our male vocalist. We have a track already set up for our male vocalist over here. That track already has a bunch of effects set up as a template for playback. So that's gonna sound great during playback, but the problem is while we record, because we're using the direct monitor feature, it's gonna sound just like my voice right now. It's gonna sound completely dry, not terribly inspiring for a performance. If we engage the direct monitoring feature of our track in our DAW and we raise that slider, then you can hear, we start to hear that. So that's the effect of our computer's latency making that whole round trip. And it's not cool, like vibey analog delay, it's latency. So it's tied directly to the latency setting of our computer and the audio buffer setting. So instead what we're gonna do is we're gonna disable the effects for the time being. And we're gonna come up here to our sends. And we're gonna create some sends on our track instead. And we want to be able to use the effects of our DAW, but still use the direct monitoring feature of our audio interface, which gives us that nice, clean, latency-free performance that our audio interface provides. It's going to bypass the computer's latency altogether. Some audio interfaces actually allow direct hardware control from within Cubase of this feature, but ours does not, so this option here is grayed out. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to come up here in our sends, and we already have some sends in our project already set up. We have a vocal reverb, and we've got a vocal delay, and we have an instrument reverb set up. So first, let's create a send that goes to our vocal delay. But instead, we're going to do something different here. We're going to come up to the pre and post knob right here, and we're going to make sure that's in the pre position. If you just hover your mouse over it, it'll tell you which position it's in. Currently, it's in pre. And the next thing we're going to do is come down here and make sure that our fader is turned all the way down because in the pre position, we don't have to have the fader up to send audio over to those effects buses. This pre position switch is going to allow us to use this to send it instead. And because that channel fader isn't going to be up, we won't be incurring any of the machine's latency, at least not audibly, because we're not going to hear it. So let's do that now. Let's turn on the send now that this is in the pre-position and we're gonna be sending it to the Vox delay. If we come over here and we engage the track monitor feature and we turn that on because our fader is down, we're not gonna hear any of that computer latency problems that we have. And now we're gonna slide this up slowly until we hear that effect in the background.
down. Check one two. Check one two. Check one two. Check one two. Check. We're kind of using the computer's latency to our advantage because it's already going to delay it by a couple of milliseconds or, ten, or five or even 10 milliseconds. And so that's way too distracting to record a direct signal with. But for digital effects like delay and reverb, it works pretty well. Let's do the same thing with the reverb. We'll come up here and we'll create a send that goes to the vocal reverb. And we'll do the same thing. We'll make sure that this position here is in the pre-position and for the time being, let's turn the delay off just so we can hear what we're doing. Now we'll engage the monitor button and we'll start to slowly bring that send up to the vocal reverb. Check, one, two, check, one, two. And as you can hear, now we have some reverb on the track as well during our actual recording. And we're still bypassing the computer's latency for the actual recorded track because our audio interface is direct monitoring that to us. The only downside to this is that we don't get any of the effects that are dynamic, meaning things that affect the tone immediately. EQs, compressors, pitch correct, auto-tune, all those kinds of things. Those effects require the audio stream to be produced immediately. In that case, you would hear those latencies. So at least where delay and reverbs are concerned, this trick really makes the computer latency work to our advantage here and gives us kind of the best of both worlds. This next method involves using what's known as a DI box. And this particular method allows us to bypass the latency of the computer completely. And it's great for things like instruments, like electric guitar and electric bass, because we're going to be printing the direct signal of that instrument, but we're going to be hearing the sound from our own rig and setup. Let's check it out. While most bass players are fine recording their instrument direct into the audio interface with a dry signal, like direct monitoring provides, most guitar players need their sound and their tone to be intact while they're recording. This next method still uses our audio interface's direct monitoring feature, but still hear and have our original tone to use as a reference and a dry signal that we can reamp in software later. Before you start tracking, you got one of two choices to make, and that is where to put the DI box in your signal path. The first is the most obvious, that's directly after the guitar. You literally plug your guitar cord into the direct box, you take the parallel output, plug that into your pedals or directly into your amp, and then the XLR or mic cable goes directly to your recorder. This gives you the most amount of flexibility after the fact. You can reamp in software, you can reamp in hardware, and it's really the most useful if you're recording yourself. But there's a reason you might want to pick the second method, and that is to put the direct box after your pedals, but before the amplifier. So you plug your guitar into your pedals, you plug your pedal output, the last pedal in your chain, into the direct box, and then the parallel output goes directly to the amp, and then the mic cable goes to your recorder. After you plug the direct sound into your recorder, then you put a microphone in front of the cabinet and then record that signal as well. Then both those signals get recorded side by side into your DAW. This gives you the best of both worlds. You have latency-free recording, you have the original reference from the microphone so you could hear what your tone was that you had for the song or the idea. And you have a completely dry signal that you can reamp in software later using Cubase's own VST amp, which is very good, or Amplitude or Guitar Rig or whatever other VSTIs you may have. One of the most challenging times to deal with latency is definitely at the end of your project when you've got a ton of plugins and a ton of tracks and a lot of VSTIs, especially if you're only monitoring through your audio interface and your audio interface doesn't offer any kind of direct monitoring feature, you're going to experience the total amount of that system latency. Now, back in the day, we used to kind of pick through our project and try to find the most power-hungry plugins, and we would disable those one by one, and it was tedious, but it worked. But there's a much better way to do it, especially at the end of a project where you've got a lot of stuff piling up. So here we are at the final stages of a long rock project. It sounds like this. All right, so you can see on playback, we've got quite a bit of stuff going on here, and we're really starting to push the computer a bit. A lot of tracks, a lot of effects, a lot of VSTs. So let's jump over to the console view and get a better idea of what we're looking at here. And you can see there's a lot of stuff going on here. You can see from the latencies here, if you don't have this setting visible in your console view, come up here to the setup window and simply choose channel latency, and that'll enable that. So we can see really at a glance 
how much latency we have in the project. And some of these are pretty stout, you know, 105 milliseconds here, uh, 28 on the master bus. But at this stage of the project, we still need to actually add some VST instrument performances to it. So we need to engage something that's really going to help this. And we're going to go back to the track view here. We're going to enable a feature known as constrained delay compensation. So if we come up to our rightmost toolbar down here and we choose constrain delay compensation, this little button shows up right here. And what constrain delay compensation does, when we actually hit that, It'll turn off all of the effects that are adding latency above a predetermined amount. We can change the threshold at which Cubase will determine whether or not to shut the plugin down. We can come up to Cubase, come down to Preferences, and we can navigate down here to the VST window. And over here in this area, we see the delay compensation threshold for recording. It's always set at zero as a default, but we can move this up to say, let's say we one of our favorite plugins induces 0.6 milliseconds, actually. Let's put it to 0.7. Now any plugins that produce more than 0.7 milliseconds of latency, Cubase will automatically shut down. Now when we jump back to the track view and we click on the constrained delay compensation button and look at the console here, we can see these effects here. Any plugins that are activated for VST instrument channels or audio track channels that are record enabled or group channels and output channels have all been temporarily disabled. But if you notice, there's still a lot of plugins that haven't been disabled, specifically Steinberg's de -esser. This is a really good example of a plugin that has a look ahead feature. This allows it to act a lot more efficiently on the signal but it generates quite a bit of latency. We'll notice that by clicking the constrained delay button, it has eliminated a lot of the heavy hitters and taken a bunch of those guys out of the mix and it's made our latency a whole lot tighter, but this still hasn't been disabled. But if we come up here and we record enable the track, look what happens. We actually go into live mode now on the de -esser. What that means is that Cubase is actually disabling the look ahead feature, the part that's generating the latency in the first place. The generated latency is eliminated by putting the plugin in live mode, and the computer has to put that audio signal all the way through the audio path, especially if we hit the track monitor button because we need to hear that in real time. So it's only the things that are directly in the live audio path that get actually powered off. Cubase can easily handle all the other tracks and things with the audio buffers and the ASIO guard. But there's an important distinction. It's not just bypassing them. It's physically powering them off so that they're completely disconnected from the VST audio system. Here we have a drum synth. If we come up to the drum synth track and we enable the track monitoring button and we strike the pads, you can see That's far too much latency to really make a performance, especially at this stage of the project, very practical. However, if we come up to our constrained delay compensation button and we hit that, now we have a completely playable and much more realistic instrument to work with. In this final example, we're gonna learn how to bypass your computer's latency completely all together by using a mixer. An audio mixer allows a lot more sophisticated routing and send options than you have with just a regular audio interface. Now, because Featherlight Recording Studio is a fully functional recording studio, we had to solve the latency problem a long time ago. Our clients come in and they want latency-free recording and they don't want to mess with any of that kind of stuff at all. And how we get around that, and how most studios do, is by using a mixer. This allows us to bypass the computer's latency altogether. A mixer has far more sophisticated routing options that allows us to do things like build monitor sends and that kind of stuff so that the client hears nothing but a clean and latency-free signal on their end. There are basically three different kinds of mixers. There's fully analog mixers, fully digital mixers, and then there's hybrid combinations of the two. And since we have both analog and digital equipment here in the studio, we have several different mixers that we use for several different things depending on the task at hand. But the one thing that most mixers have in common is the ability to create mixes that are completely independent from the sound going out the main outputs. And they do that with what are known as buses or aux buses. Some mixers have just a few and some have many, but the more buses you have, the more mixes you can create independent from the master. Our fully digital mixer here in the studio can create up to 16 
stereo mix buses, and we have up to 10 physical outputs on the back that we can assign those mixes to if needed. That's great for tracking or for building headphone mixes to send to our headphone distribution amp for additional performers. And because it has an audio interface built into the mixer itself, all of those inputs show up as available inputs in our DAW when we go to record with it. The recording signal is taken directly after the input section of the mixer, and then from there, it goes straight to our DAW. The computer playback shows up on a pair of spare mixer channels here and is mixed in with our live inputs into the mixer board. And so by the time we hear the playback, Cubase has already taken care of all the delay compensation in the background neat and tidy, and we never actually experienced the latency in the first place. Here on our fully analog board, the mixer board works exactly the same way. We just don't have as many of the buses and features and effects to choose from like we did on the digital board. It's important to note that while owning a mixer allows you to bypass the computer's latency altogether for things that are recorded into it, like vocals and electric and acoustic instruments and drums, if you're recording VSTi instruments, especially at the end of the project, you will still need to use the constrained delay compensation button to get as low latency performance as you can. And just like on our digital board, by the time that record signal makes it over to our DAW and gets recorded and then is returned back to us on the channels here on our mixer, the latency has already taken place and Cubase has already done the delay compensation for us. So all we really hear is what we're actually recording into the board and our computer DAW's playback nice and clean on our mixer here. Many of the newer, higher-end audio interfaces, especially the multi-track ones like those from Universal Audio and other manufacturers, have very powerful DSP built right into the unit itself, which allows it to operate exactly like a mixer and give you incredibly low latency monitoring choices right in the one space unit, but you're paying a premium price to get all of that in a tiny space, and you're giving up a huge amount of input and output hardware connection options that most mixers provide, and those extra routing options come in extremely handy, and you can see all those things clearly from across the room. Whether it's a mixer or an audio interface or some combination of both, it all boils down to your workflow and your specific recording requirements. So there's a handful of suggestions of how to deal with latency throughout the entire duration of your project. And as you can see, it can be kind of a pain in the butt if you don't have a couple of plans in place to really work around that, especially if you're working for other people or you have other clients coming in and you wanna give them clean latency-free signals to record with. Hey, if you learned something or if this was helpful in any way, please hit the subscription and notification bells. It really does help keep the channel going and I really appreciate it. Thanks for hanging out with me today. Stay safe, be creative, add something creative to the world. It could really use it. We'll catch you guys in the next video.